Uh, Richardson first. Uh, he was on a B-17 bomber that was shot down over France, and it took 49 days to get out of France. Uh, the French underground helped him uh, escape the Germans. He lived the Germans. And he's going to tell you about his experiences. He has a map and a model of planes. And uh, when he's finished, uh, he'd be glad to answer any questions you have. And then after that, we're going to take a break. And then we're going to hear Colonel Enderline. And I'll tell you what his interesting story is going to be. been overseas courtesy of Uncle Sam <coughs> on a five-day cruise on the liner Queen Mary. Now, on the way across, I made a prophecy to my crew. I said, we're going over, we're going to fly our 25 missions, we're going to be home for Easter. Now, we land in England and we're assigned to the 8th Air Force. 388th bomb group flying B-17s similar to this model. This aircraft has a crew of 10, a pilot, co-pilot, a bombardier in the nose, a navigator, top turret is engineer, ball turret, radio operator gunner, two ace gunners, and a tail gunner with a total of 10 guns firing 50 caliber ammunition. This is the size of the shell. Now, on, we had flown and completed 14 missions. And the morning of the 15th mission, we go down to briefing and we're assigned an aircraft which is not our primary aircraft. Our primary aircraft was the Captain Joe dedicated to the brother of the pilot who was a captain in the Air Force killed in the Pacific in the early stages of the war. We were assigned an aircraft, the Mary Ellen. Well, we take off, assemble, fly across the channel. Our target, Frankfurt, Germany. Now, I was a navigator, and the only means I have of telling where the aircraft is is by forecast winds, and temperature aloft along the route, which is given to us by the weatherman. And all we do is on our chart, we plot our course. Every 10 minutes, we have a point of where we are supposed to be. So we fly south of the target and turn to come in on the target on a headwind so that we're flying at our slowest speed, giving the bombardier the most time for lining up on his target. Above the target, our aircraft was hit with anti-aircraft fire. One engine was knocked out and temporary control of the aircraft was lost and we went into a dive. Well, the pilot and the co-pilot managed to get control of the aircraft and level off and ask for a heading home. So I gave them the best possible heading I had. So we are flying in clouds for oh, about two and a half hours. And I'm plotting the course. And I don't know what made me do it, but I called up Pete, that's the co-pilot, and said, hey, Pete, what's your magnetic compass reading, which is a little compass in the dash of the aircraft. What I have is called a repeater, which is an instrument up on the bulkhead. The main unit is a gyroscope in the back of the aircraft which maintains the <coughs> compass. And all I get is a reading from it. And we had been holding a real good course. So when Pete told me they had the magnetic heading of his compass, I said, oh no, we're 20 degrees off. So I had to go clear back to the target area, recompute everything for the 20 degree air that my compass had been showing. And in about three hours, I am caught up to date with an approximate location. Now, in the meantime, we're flying in clouds. We have no ground contact, no way of identifying a point where we might be. So we start to hit clouds. 
clouds that are breaking up, which is bad in one way, because then we are visible. And first thing you know, we hear calls, fighter aircraft here, fighter aircraft there. And in the meantime, I'm trying to verify a positive location. So the fighters hit us. And I hear the co-pilot say, hey, Frank, this wing's on fire. So Frank says, well, I guess it's time to get out. We're at approximately 1,500 feet, no more clouds, and he rings a bell, bell which is a signal, bail out. So in, at first he says, what's our location? I said, Frank, as close as I can tell you, we are near the border of Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. We're in that general vicinity. That's as close as I can give you right now. So I reach over and pull his gate hatch and bend over and look out. The next thing I know, I'm out in the air floating like this, just looking around, everything is quiet. And I decide, well, I better pull a ripcord, and I pull the ripcord, my parachute open. And then I can see in the distance, here's a parachute, there's a parachute, there's something tumbling. I say, oh no, somebody's chute didn't open. And I watch it till it goes down below the trees. It did not open. Later, I find out that one of the crew's parachutes <coughs> did not open. So in the meantime, I'm concerned with myself. I'm falling. They had never taught us anything about parachute control. And I'm falling, going backwards. But I had known enough about jumping off buildings that when you hit, you collapse your knees and you roll to absorb the shock. The only thing I hit, going backwards. So I get up and unhook my chute. And we have a pair of what I call GI shoes, and somebody said, what's GI shoes? They're government-issued walking shoes. They're not shoes. They're about half-length boots, which we call GI shoes. And we always carried them because we were wearing electrically heated suits and wool boots for comfort because it got up to 50 degrees below zero up there. So I take my flying boots off, put on my shoes, and roll up my parachute, put it down in the gully. I notice some French farmers over in the field. So I walked over to them, took off my 45 and handed it to them. They rolled over a clot of dirt and covered it. That was gone. And nobody said, come on, I'll take you, let's go. They didn't say anything. So they just said, Germans, Germans, go. Well, I was curious as to what happened to my crew, so I started to go over to where they had the line of fall. And one of the Frenchmen got on a bicycle, rode down around the field, and met me at the bottom corner when I come out. He said, oh, no, 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 go, go, Germans. So I figured, okay, that's the best thing to do. So I turned and took off. So I, this was about noon on a Saturday. So I walked for a couple hours. I stayed mainly on the roads, and when I'd hear traffic, I'd get off into the woods and hide. And that evening, I came to a farmhouse, and I walked in, and the working people were gathered, I guess, getting ready to leave for the day. And I tried to explain to them that I was an American aviator. I had been shot down. And one of the fellows says, come on. So he took me. We went up in mountain ways. So we sit around the table and I tried to explain to him B-17. I shot down, given the area I was shot down in. <clears throat> and okay, we go to bed. The next morning we get up, they give me some clothes. Uh, when I was dressed, I looked like a bum. If any of you have seen the picture Columbo, you know he's famous for that top coat that he wears. Well, I had one similar to that, only it had a few rips and tears in it. And I did look like a bum. So we start out the next morning walking. We walk for about two hours. We come into a little town. There's a beer garden there, and on the sign, sign on the side says, Lee to three kilometers. Uh, oh, no, that's where I was shot down yesterday. So we go in the bar room, and I try to explain to them, hey, no, I didn't want to hear That's where I shot down. Well, they refused any more help. They didn't want anything more to do with me. They said, okay, make yourself scared. So I started again. So I had to retrace my steps from the day before. And 
I traveled again, and I went through a town. This was Sunday. There was a woman in the street. I approached her and said something to her. I must have scared the wits out of her. She took off. So that night, well, where was I going to stay? So there was a church there. Oh, well, that might be a pretty good place. So I went in the church, and they had pews, and every so often they had those dividers, raised dividers. So I couldn't stretch out. I had to lay doubled up. And there was a cover on the organ. This was the 29th, 30th of January, which was pretty cold. I tried to cover up and keep warm. The next morning I got up. The doors were locked. Uh, so it was one of those that you just press the handle, you know, and unlock. I got out of there. And I started walking again. But in the meantime, the first place that I had stayed, they had given me a calendar page for the month of January. On the back of it was a map of a department. Now, we have counties. France has departments. And it was a complete road map of all the little secondary roads, which was far better than this escape map that I have. Now, I had sit down and opened up my escape kit, which is this, which they had issued every time you went out on a mission for a particular area you're going into. And it contained a compass, money, maps like this, water purification tablets, concentrated candy for energy, and things that they thought would be necessary. And their little map was a whole lot better than this map as far as detail for the area I was in. So I just folded this up, put it in my pocket, and used their map. About sometime in the afternoon, I was going through a town. I hear a bicycle coming up behind me. I thought, uh oh. Come around me and stop. French policeman. He looked at me, says something. I look at him. I'm a deaf mute. I know nothing. He asked me a couple more questions. I still maintain silence. He looked at me. He got on his bicycle, went down the street. And I went down this street. I went out through the woods, got out beyond town, and looked back. There was a couple of engines, locomotives, laying over the bank the night before somebody had blown up the tracks and derailed these locomotives. I guess they were looking for people that had done that. I think the French policemen knew who I was, but some of the French police were patriotic. Well, I think that's one reason I wasn't picked up. So I kept on walking. That evening, I come into another farmyard, and an American airman shot down. I'd like something to eat. I never asked for help. I just asked for something to eat. They say, if they're going to help you, they will help you. If you ask for help, they immediately become suspicious. So I asked for something to eat. So it was a nice farm family. They took me in the house, gave me something to eat. They had two young girls. Well, one wasn't, she was still young, but her husband was a French flyer who had been killed in the early part of the war. So that evening we sat down, they had French to English, and it was French dictionary. So that's how we communicated. So they said, okay, you stay with us, we have some friends. So they took me out in the barn in a loft, and that's where I stayed. They would bring me my breakfast and then take me in the house in the afternoon for the evening meal. So I spent about a week or ten days there, and one day a Red Cross ambulance pulled into the yard. They'd take me out, load me in the ambulance, take off. I don't know where we're going. So we pulled into a place, which I later found out, was Blancourt, France. J.P. Morgan had a castle in France, a real castle, moat around it. They had wild animals and everything, you know, in the finer days. And they took me in to the kitchen, the cook's kitchen. Set me down. This lady come in, sit down, starts talking. She asked me questions about ball teams, different things. And I keep answering. Pretty soon she started to laugh. 
seems to be so funny. She says, do you know why they brought you here? And I said, well, yes and no. And she said, they brought you here for me to verify whether you are what you say you are or whether you could be a German parachuted and circulating, trying to infiltrate the French underground, which they were doing all the time, trying to break up these resistance organizations, these helper organizations that were helping all Allied airmen that had been shot down. But she said, your reactions and your answers and your tone and everything, she said, you couldn't be anything but. So that is where my beret came into existence. This is a French beret that belonged to J.P. Morgan's chauffeur. They gave it to me. I wore it the rest of my time in France. So they load me up again into the ambulance. We take off again. We wind up in a small town. They pull the horn of garage door open. They drive in. I get out. They take me in the house. They take me into the front room. There stands my pilot. He, too, had managed to evade the Germans. So we're talking, trying to reconstruct what had happened. He tells me the engineer broke a leg and wasn't able to travel, so he gave him his flight jacket to keep him warm. And while we're talking, we're here singing. So we go over the window and look out. And here comes a bunch of German youngsters about your age to come marching up the street. They had field pieces all broke down. One was carrying a wheel, a couple of them carrying a barrel. They had been out on field exercises. Right across the road, they go in at the German SS school. And here's a garage right across part of the underground. So they take me from there the house of a woman who has a son a couple years older than you and there's a Canadian there that had been wounded on a flight and would not have made it back to his base so they put a shoe on and threw him out hoping that when he hit the ground he would get help which he did the French got him they took him into the hospital under the nose of the Germans the doctor operated on him sewed him back up, and in the stitches, they sewed the cross of Lorraine, took him out of the hospital, took him to this house. Well, I ate pretty good because they gave him lots of red meat to build up his blood, so I stayed there until the son got a note, conscription notice to report. So he took off. Well, they had to get us out of there. So we stayed at another house for a while. And it's unclear to me how we got from there, a little town by the name of Shoney, down to a town by the name of Creil, C-R-E-I-L. Now here, I lived in a house at the bottom of a butt. And up above, it was a German airfield. And these ME-109s would come in there for a landing, and they spit and sputtered worse than an old Model T Ford. I wondered how they were able to fly, but they did. So there was a P-24 pilot, myself, stayed with this elderly couple for quite a while until they decided it was time to move. So then they moved us from there, take us down to the railroad station. While we're sitting in the station, I look around at the yards, and it is jam-packed <coughs> with flat cars, with tanks, tank cars, ammunition, you name it, anything for the war effort was in that rail yard. And I said to the P-24 pilot, I said, boy, what a target this would make. So we leave on a train and go into Paris. They take us to this apartment, and my pilot was supposed to leave later on in the day for the same destination in Paris. So we turned on the radio, picked up the BBC and listening to it, and the 26 is bomb, Crail, C-R-E-I-L. Now, I went to school, Bombardier School, with a very good friend that went to B-24 
96 is after he graduated. I went on to navigation school. So I didn't think too much of it then. And my main concern was, did Frank get out? Well, later on, I learned he had. Now, the apartment that I stayed in in Paris belonged to a countess, Countess de Hespel. <coughs> Excuse me. She was a medical student in Paris at the time. And I don't know how many flyers went through her apartment. Now, the next day, she took B-24 pilot and myself down for a walk on the streets of Paris. We walked over to the Eiffel Tower up on a big promenade, stood there looking at the Eiffel Tower. When we turned around, there's a German soldier with a rifle on. He's walking guard duty back and forth across the entrance. He said, uh oh. She said, now look, don't get excited. Just walk off here as if nothing is unusual. So we did with no problem. So we walked out on the Champs de Lisay, their main boulevard, we walked up a ways, we could see the Arc de Triomphe, walked around, back to her apartment, and she gave me three large postcards of the Eiffel Tower, the Arc de Triomphe, and the Champs de Lisay. <coughs> I could never pronounce that word right anyway. Anyway, I stuck them in my pockets. So the next following they take us down to the main station in Paris. We are headed for the Brittany coast. That's this trip here that you see. Where is my cord? Down here. That's Paris coming out of the Brittany coast. We're in the station waiting for the train. And my pilot is smoking a cigarette. The German soldier walks up. And I'm watching. And I you know, get a good light on the end, hand it over to the German soldier, lights a cigarette, and walks away. Oh boy. I don't know whether that's an American custom or whether it was a universal custom, lighting a cigarette off a cigarette. So we get on a train. Now their passenger cars have an aisle, runs the full length of the car, and on the side small rooms that can seat six or eight. So there is a girl and three, three aviators. There's a young man and three aviators. I was assigned to the young man. So what we would do would get in a bunch. And when the doors would train open, make for one compartment so we're all in there together there's no chance of a German asking somebody a question to tip them off, you know, that we can't answer it or anything. So I don't recall how long it was on a train trip out there. But we get out to a little town by the name of St. Bruce, and we get off the train, and the station is on a city square. There's a big block. It's an open park in the middle with buildings on all three sides of the station on this side. Now, our signal for pickup is a rolled newspaper under our arm. So we get off the train, we get out, we walk across the block, start out through the country, newspaper under our arm, go clear through town. Nobody pays any attention to us. We come back to the station, nobody pays any attention. So we, what do we do? There's nobody acknowledged that we're there or anything. So the girl said, well, I'll try again. She takes her three fellows, walks down again. As she goes around the corner at the far end of the square, there's a German headquarters unit right on the corner. German officers come out. They're looking down the street. And we're up in the station. So anyway, pretty soon she comes back. The fellows aren't with her. She said, they left. They said, there's some mix-up. We're not hanging around. We're leaving. We don't want to get you involved. They took off. So the fellow comes over and he says, you stay. He took off. He caught them and brought them back. But in the meantime, what do you do? You're sitting there in the station. You 
don't know anybody, so I'm sitting on a bench. Best thing to do is be asleep. So I'm sitting there like this. I open my eyes and look down. There's two pair of feet pointed right at me. The one is a blue with red trim pants. That's a French policeman. This one, I don't know. But I do know that they're standing looking at me. I'm still asleep. I don't know how long it was until I looked down and the feet are gone. I look around. The fella comes back and he says, we've got to get out of here. So he gets tickets for the next train out. So we wait. train pulls in. They open up the gates again. In the meantime, another German soldier walks over to the pilot for a light. Same routine. No problem. So we get on the train and go back one station and get off. Now, we walk out into the country to a rendezvous point, which is the House of Alphonse, which is the story of a Reader's Digest article years ago. There was a collection point <coughs> for down to 80 years. There we find out what happened. The night before, a British gunboat that comes in to make the pickup in this particular operation was discovered by the German shore batteries. They opened fire. The gunboat fired back and turned and backed out into the channel. Well, what's going to happen? Are they coming back tonight? Nobody knows. We have to sweat it out for that night listening to the BBC, British Broadcasting Company. And the message comes over, welcome to the House of Alphonse, which is saying, we are coming over tonight. So that night, they load us into a, a truck, canvas covering over it, drive us around. I don't know whether it was to confuse us or dodging German patrols or what. To a certain point, they let us out. From there, we have to walk. Then we start walking on backcountry roads. We'll come up to an intersection, and they stop. They wait until a German guard and his dog walking patrol passes that checkpoint. Now they get there early to make sure that they know that guard has passed so they don't get out in the middle of the intersection and have the guard come on. We do this several times until we come to a field. They say, okay, now take hand. And you start out across that field, you don't go straight. They go zigzag. I didn't think much about it, but I was close to the tail end. And without too much activity, I was getting a little bit pooped. So I lost hands with the guy ahead of me. So I'll catch up to him. I cut across one of those corners, caught up to them. Okay. And we get over to a bluff that was almost perpendicular down to the beach. Now, you couldn't go down that forward because your center of gravity was out too far. You had to turn this way and almost lay against the wall going down to the beach. So we get down there, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait. And they're just about ready to give up hope and start back, which meant we would have to climb back up that hill. And they see a little flicker light signal. So they have their flashlight. They click their signal. And the first thing you know, some little battery powered launches comes into the beach. Okay, they load us all on this particular thing. There was about 24 of us. There was a, an Indian Army officer, a couple of French collaborators, and a couple of undercover people, and all the aviators. They get us out and put us on this British gunboat. Well, after we're all aboard, they turn around and they head out to sea. Well, we're down in the hole. There's no windows or anything. And uh, pretty soon I said, hey, I'm, I'm going up on a bridge. So I went up on a bridge. I was talking to them up there, looking at their maps and stuff. And I said, what's all you? Well, those are minefields. We're going over them. We don't. We aren't deep enough draft. We're going over the top of them. They said, there's a German convoy over there. We're trying to make up our mind. Our orders were to pick you people up, take you back. But in the meantime, after we picked you up, we're on our own. We can do what we want to. If we want to attack that convoy,
convoy we can. We're trying to decide whether to or not. So pretty soon the word comes down and says, ah, we're headed home. So they take us across the channel and pull into this bay. There's a big mothership sunken into the middle of the, the bay where four of these gunboats tie up. They take you off, take you in, give you a good bath, let you have a good shower, give you a nice big healthy Hell, the serving of British rum. I'm not a drinking man, but I think I drank that. And give us an issue of clothing, which was uh, Canadian uh, Air Force. And then they take us from there into London to MI9, which is the British Intelligence and Interrogation. They interrogate us and notify our unit and have somebody sent down to identify us. So after the identification is made and they're done interrogating, they say, okay, we'll let you go out on the street to London. So I went out on the street, walking down the street, and who do I walk into? <coughs> My friend from Bombardier School, Joe Renard, the Bombardier I was telling you about. Well, we're talking a little bit. And I say, hey, Joe, what do you know about a little town by the name of C-R-E-I-L? He said, ma'am, when we hit that place, he said, everything come up at us but the kitchen sink. He said, that was some target. I didn't dare tell him. I had left there in the morning before they hit it. So, it goes on. We go back up to our base for a little while, and they won't let us fly again. For the simple reason that if you're shot down, they're afraid you'll head for the same area that you got help. Germans would be watching and following, and you could lead to the breakup of a good organization. So I was sent back home, come back to Atlantic City, processed, come home on leave, walked up on the front door, knocked on the door, Easter Sunday morning. I was the only one to fulfill that prophecy. I belong to an organization called the Air Force Escape and Evasion Society, which is open to members that have gone through the same experience. And we have reunions every year, and we bring over helpers. And now we're getting into the ones that were children in those days and bringing them over to our reunions to help repay the kindness that we received from them during our time on the continent. And I was exactly 49 days from the day I was shot down until the day that I returned to England. I guess that pretty well covers everything. Uh, do you have any questions of any part of it or anything? <coughs> Colonel Richardson, I think it would be uh, I think if you told them about your aircraft, who made the aircraft, what the wingspan is, the weight, how much runaway you needed to land and take off, and what was the uh, what was the capacity of your bomb load when you went on a bombing mission, and then what height did you fly? Okay, you're putting me on a little spot there because it's been a long time. It's a, a Boeing B-17, four engines, generally Pratt Whitney engines, and our bomb load could be anywhere from about two to 4,000 pounds, which is very small compared to the bombers of today. Now, we had rubber tanks in the wings, along with our other main tanks, for fuel for a longer range mission. Now, I think our longest mission was approximately 13 hours. Now, as far as wingspan and length, I don't think I can uh, uh, say offhand just and for altitude, uh, most of our bombing missions was anywhere from about 26 to 30,000 feet. Now, later on uh, in 44, when they started to hit the German launch sites for their V-2 missiles and stuff like that, our altitude would only run 10, 12,000 feet, and the missions would only run four or 6,000, which we considered milk runs. Uh, they're German 88s, 
They could put that black stuff up to 28,000 feet pretty easy. I know the first time that uh, I flew a commercial jet in this country, I was going to Houston, and uh, one of the flight attendants came by and I tapped him on the shoulder and said, come here. I said, you know, the last time I was up this high, I said, I could look out and see black spots all over the sky. And he just looked at me and he said, well, what do you mean? And I told him, well, I said, well, that was uh, over Germany. And I said, they were shooting at me. And I said, that was black out there. <laughs> Anything else? I'll ask you one more question, Colonel. You mentioned the town of Creel, and you mentioned the ME-109. I imagine you're referring to the Metro Smith. Is that Metro Smith 109. Okay. Yeah, uh, four, 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 a number of years ago, they had a very interesting air show at the Johnstown Airport. And I was fascinated by the stories that these World War II fighter pilots were telling me about their experiences in Germany. And they mentioned the Messerschmitt. And there's one thing that sticks in my mind. And they said, it's a good thing that Hitler didn't have too many of those Messerschmitts because they were far superior to our fighter planes that we had in Europe at that time. Because these, some of these gentlemen were engaged in dogfights with, with the German uh, pilots that flew these measures yeah. in. And I just wonder if they really were that superior to our fighter plane. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to say in that respect. I'm going to say it's training and personnel. Now, you can have the best aircraft possible with the poorest personnel flying them, and they're worthless. Now, we had, at that time, as you say, maybe our aircraft wasn't as good as theirs. But I think we had the superior personnel, which more than made up for the difference. And later on in the war, when Germany was having a hard time getting pilots, their personnel efficiency kept dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And that was one reason. Another reason was when they developed the P-51 with the wing tanks and really got it rolling, it was a superior aircraft in the European theater. And with the wing tanks, they were able to follow us a lot further on our missions. In other words, we uh, most of the missions that we flew in the early part of the war, after they got over the channel for maybe a half hour, the fighters had to turn and go back to England. And we had to depend on our own guns for protection. Now, after they got the wing tanks and everything developed for the 51, and the 47, they were able to fly maybe an hour and a half to two hours into the continent and gave us much better protection. That's when our losses started to decrease. Now, at the beginning of the war, it was 25 missions and you're done. Now, the Memphis Bell was on on Sunday night. I don't know whether any of you saw that or not. Now, a lot of that was uh, movie stuff. Now, Maybe every incident in that happened, but it didn't necessarily happen on the same mission. It might have happened to other aircraft and other missions, and they sort of put it all in there to just sort of heighten the uh, suspense of the movie. But at first it was 25 missions, and on the early missions, a group would go out, maybe half of those aircraft returned. So how many times can you go out at that ratio and figure on finishing 25 missions? Now, after we started these milk runs, as I said, into these launching sites, then it went up to 30, and then in the latter stages, it was up to 35. But at that time, they had full fighter protection <coughs> and everything, which increased their chances of doing it tremendously. Thank Anything you. else? Any other questions? One of the students wanted to know if that was your original uniform. No, I have to tell you this. still fit into the uniform. <laughs> At the beginning, we were Army Air Force. And our uniform was a green jacket and either green or pink trousers. It was, it was a snappy uniform. Actually, it was a little bit snappier than this one. But when the Air Force became <coughs> a unit of its own, then they went to Air Force Blues. Now, the reason my 
my uniform still fits me is that I maintain an affiliation with the Air Force Reserves. And as such, I purchased new uniforms when I went to Air Force Blues. Now my original uniform, in no way would it have fit. I was approximately 150 pounds in those days. <laughs> Why don't you, Kenny? 